Chen. She is an associate professor at the Beijing Normal University. Prior to this, she worked at the Zhenyao Shangdong Liverpool University and University of Nottingham and University of Oxford School of Law. Her area of research includes internet governance, communications policy, regulation and law with special focus on China. Currently, she is working on projects on the internet governance in China, AI, big data ethics, and social media. Uh, Dr. Jet Deng is a co-chair of uh, Denton's in China. Uh, he focuses on competition and antitrust practices, data privacy, protection, dispute re resolution. He has a, a long history on antitrust filing for domestic and cross-border M&A transactions. In 2004, he started participating in the antitrust legislation and providing domestic and foreign clients with legal services. In 2012, he, be, he started engaging in cybersecurity and data protection. He has a, a long history for the last 10 years working on privacy protection, cross-border transfer for his clients as well as um, many other occasions. So he's been asked to be an expert, so it's great to have him with us today. Lockney Shu uh, specializes in trade and investment law. She has an LLM from Harvard and uh, LLB from National University in Singapore. She is an advocate uh, and solicitor in Singapore since 1986, and her current appointment is a professor of law at the Singapore Management University since 2015. Dr. Rolf H. Weber is a professor of international and business law at Zurich University, acting as the uh, co-chair and director of research programs on financial, financial markets and regulation. He is also a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong in China. His main fields of research are in internet information technology law, international business law, media law, competition, and international finance law. And then Dr. Mansi Keita is a senior research fellow at the Indian Council for Research and International Economic Relations and Foreign Trade. And I also have um, my online moderator, Linda, who's moving over here right now. She's also a last minute fill in. So you've got to appreciate all of us <laughs> who, who really care about uh, cross-border and want to make sure that we have a good dialogue today. And unfortunately, some of our colleagues are not feeling well. Courtney, I don't know if you're watching, but we are happy to be here in your stead, but we miss not having you here. So uh, Dr. Chin, let's start with you. Thank you. So, yes, can I have my PowerPoint presentation on? Thank you. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce myself. As I said, I'm Dr. Chin from the Beijing Normal University. So first of all, I would like to uh, talk about, because I have five minutes, to give a brief introduction about China's approach in terms of the uh, cross-border data flows. So uh, basically, they have a, a the, the, the Chinese, Chinese approach is based on uh, what we call the legal secure and the free flow of cross-border data flow. And uh, so uh, there's uh, some, some important concept they want to, you know, precondition they want to emphasize in their uh, policy regarding cross-border flow, for example, like a sovereignty, personal data protections and the national securities. And the, in relation to that, they have a data classification and grading system. So basically they grade the data into different uh, categories uh, in terms of importance to the uh, different uh, national interests or the public interest of national security or personal uh, privacy protections. Okay, China also joined the bilateral FTA agreement, for example, like China, Australia, FTA, and also regional trade agreements such as ICP, CPTTP, and the DEPA. So uh, if you look at the China's uh, uh, official position towards the cross-border data flows, so this is uh, what they submit to the uh, WTO, uh, the e-commerce e com uh, e committee. So basically they say the trade-related uh, data flow are uh, important, but the more important they think is the uh, precondition of security. So therefore, you know, they, the, 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 their cross-border policy has to, you know, emphasize on the security. And uh, so therefore it's necessary data flow should be orderly in compliance with members' respective law and the regulation because the core concern for China is the uh, security. So 
If you look at uh, there's actually there's a two important law in regulating the cross-border data flows in China. The first one is called the Personal Information Protection Law, which uh, set up the compliance condition for exporting the personal data. Okay, so it, it, it is only it, this is particular for the personal data. So if the data process wants to uh, export their uh, personal data, they have to fulfill one of the four conditions. The first condition is they pass the security assessment. The second is that like, they have the protection certificate. They can get a protection certificate, uh, personal information protection certificate, or they have a, a kind of standard contract with the overseas uh, receive companies uh, in, in accordance with the standard contract um, uh, provisions and uh, also there's another condition stipulated by laws so they only need to fulfill one of them so before they can export data personal data okay so this is the first law the second one is uh, called the data export security assessment measure so this is a, a really a uh, newly enacted law which uh, governs the uh, uh, if, if you if you want to export data you know you have to uh, the kind the data process or controller ha has to pass these uh, security assessment measures so that have a four type of the uh, data which uh, require security assessment. The first one is important data uh, exported by data process. Of course, they have a definition about what are important data, but I'm not going to elaborate here. Okay, so they have a particular definition about what are important data. And then secondly is the personal information uh, exported by key information infrastructure operators or data process which has uh, uh, process personal information reach 1 million people. The third uh, category is personal information uh, uh, exported by data process, you know, which accumulate uh, provide the personal information of more than 100,000 people. So and, and other situation required by the National Cyberspace Administration Department. So they so these four type of the uh, situation they have to pass the uh, security assessment. So besides these four types of information, they can export. Okay. So uh, when they do the security assessment, so they will look at uh, these three conditions. The first one is risk. What kind of risk data export may bring to the national security, public interest, and legitimate rights and interests of individual organization? The second condition is legality, legitimacy, and the necessity of the purpose, the scopes, and the methods of data export. So it's quite a, a legal, you know, uh, uh, approach. The third assessment criteria is whether the safeguard measures meet the requirement of the law and regulation and the national standard of China. So because they have to, when they export the, the data, they have to make sure there's a safeguard measures which can guarantee, you know, there's a protection of the uh, personal information. So they have a, a national standard and also law and the regulation to assess what, what do we mean by the uh, safeguard measures? Okay, so the export uh, exportation has to meet all these uh, safeguard measures. So, so, so therefore, we can see in general, you know, we can see the Chinese approach to cross-border data flow is like, is that there's only very few cases where the export data is completely uh, banded. You know, data can be legally exported after meeting certain criteria, as I said, like a security assessment, or you can get a security certificate or standard contracts. And actually, the new data export security assessment measure provide certain legal certainty because they defined only those four categories of personal information or the important data that required a part security assessment to assess the risk so other data uh, beyond these four categories they can export okay so and uh, if you look at the details of this uh, requirement you found there's a uh, actually this formulation is quite it's kind of the reference to the practice of public policy and the national security exception provision in many regional FTAs so if you look at the FTAs free trade agreements you know they have uh, two exceptions exceptions the why is the public interest exceptions the second one is national security exceptions so in chinese formulations actually we, we can see the similarity because they put the exceptions into the 
their uh, uh, security assessment measures. So they said, okay, you have to uh, make sure, you know, you, um, you, 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 you do not have a risk of national security or public interest or legitimate rights and interests of individual organizations. So basically they put all these exceptions into their measurements as well as uh, security assessment measures. So the, second, the last point I want to emphasize is that uh, if you look at the, the assessments of legality, legitimacy, and the necessity of the purpose, scopes, and methods, actually this is in light of the Article 5 of China's Personal Information Protection Law. So this is not a particular requirement, uh, additional burdens to the uh, companies which export data overseas, but, but there is also a requirement of domestic law, personal protection law for domestic company as well. So therefore, it's not a discriminatory uh, provisions, you know, which is targeted and, and non West and non domestic companies. So we, we have to recognize this as well. So and at the same time, besides of that, they also have other initiative like a global initiative in data security and the global security initiative. So they want to promote connectivity and also international collaborations. Okay, and they also want to join the negotiation and regional trade agreements. And on the other hand, we also see you know uh, up to now China has joined only one regional trade agreements, which is RECP. Uh, RCEP, uh, which also have uh, provisions to prohibit data localization and the free flow of data uh, uh, data with exceptions. And uh, also we anticipate because China is, uh, has applied to join the CPTTP and the DEPT. So this kind of the process will put a pressures. Uh, it is cross-border data policy. If uh, if they uh, successful joint, then maybe have some you know, implications on the domestic law as well. So we will see, okay? So the, the process is still going on. There's still negotiation, you know, uh, between the China and the also, also these organizations, free trade agreements. So, so if you look at the uh, historical, uh, historical development, you see uh, the, the trade, free trade agreement start with TPP, you know, in 2019, uh, 2016, and we have a CPTTP, now IECP and the DEPA. So at the moment, China just uh, joined the RCEP in 2020, and uh, so basically, according to the uh, provisions of this RECP, China has agreed that the default should be the free flow of data, and there's no forced data localization, but they want to uh, have a potential board exceptions provisions. So what I want to say is that, is that China's cross-border data rule will inevitably affect the direction of the international cross-border rules. So it's important to engage China and to becoming part of the community which can which draft, you know, share the norms and the rule creation for the futures. So this kind of engagement I think is inevitable if we want to have a global flows, you know, a framework to govern the uh, transborder uh, data flows. So, and the last, I want to say why there's a difference uh, between the Chinese approach and the U.S. and the EU approach. So, if we look at the Chinese approach, it's more emphasized on the security, uh, sovereignty, and also data protection, personal data protections. Uh, well, uh, if the, the, the U.S. approach is more emphasized on the free flow of data, because it, but uh, the EU approach is more look at protection of human rights and the privacy. Okay, but there's a, some underlying reasons for that. First of all, is because U.S. has a kind of the very strong, you know, digital service oriented firms. They are dominating the global e-commerce market. So that's uh, why they emphasize on free flow. And also in terms of regulatory framework, the, chi the American uh, re regulatory framework we call this permissive regulatory legal framework, which means they minimize the state's interventions in the market. So therefore, they prefer have less state interventions. But if you look at China, China's uh, mean uh, e-commerce form, they're not uh, kind of the you know, trend, uh, trading of data, they're more trading of the uh, uh, physical goods. Okay, so therefore, then do not uh, really focus on the data trading, you know, and then more traditional good trading. And also because of the Chinese approach, the regulatory approach, they are more emphasized on the legal regulation and the state-like regulation and the co-regulation, self-regulation. So their regulatory style is more like a combination of the state regulation, co-regulation, self-regulation. So it's not a only 
emphasize on self-regulation. So that's why we can see the different approach. And I uh, use the uh, use uh, approach which uh, is influenced by uh, two factors. The first one is that uh, uh, in EU, they have a very long tradition of human rights protection. And secondly, there's no major digital player dominating the global e-commerce market from the EU. So therefore, the lack of this initiative to promote free trade, you know. And uh, secondly, also the lack of the central government to oversee the security issue. Therefore, they haven't developed a very strong position in terms of national security. Because we, we understand the European Commission, you know, they do not have a very strong security mandate in some way, okay? So that's why we, we see the difference between these three approaches. Okay, I think that's all for, for me for now. So you can see my, we, we have published the full paper already. So this is a, well, the, 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 the website, you can download our paper. Thank you. Thank you, that was a great introduction and beginning, wow. Okay, to my other speakers, no one has to feel competitive to use more acronyms. I think she did a fabulous job there. So uh, Dr. Deng, oh, you are up next, please. Huh. Okay, uh, thank you, thank, thanks the moderator. Uh, just in? now, I think of Professor Chen uh, has already uh, introduced the legal we, framework. Uh, you may be on mute. China's, we, we need a... China's cross-border data uh, transfer okay. regulation. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, do we need to turn that one on? Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I will I will provide some uh, supplementals. Uh, from from my perspective. Sorry, uh, we still can't hear you. Can you, Mr. Mr. Ring, can you tr yeah. make sure that you're unmuted from your side of the computer? We can see that you're talking, but we can't hear you. Yeah, okay. Oh, there we go. Fabulous. Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, I don't provide some
We'll give a minute for the internet to catch up. <laughs> National trade, and uh, so uh, up to now, uh, I I see uh, from both the both the written law and the, the enforcement uh, parties, uh, and uh, the, the authority is now focused on more on, on the security issue in terms of the the, the post data transfer regulating. So the last settlement I want to uh, I want to provide is that uh, besides those regulating cross-border uh, 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 transfer of the personal information uh, in China, actually according to the DSL, the Data Security Law, and the, and the PIPL, the Personal Information Protection Law, and no one can provide any information, any data. Uh, Local, located in China to any foreign authority or any foreign judicial authority, foreign foreign courts. That's uh, totally uh, prohibited. And and the, the law uh, only provides one ex exception that uh, you have to uh, obtain approval from the uh, from the Chinese government. I handled a number of cases uh, in the past one year. In terms of those uh, international uh, cases in which you know, uh, somebody have to provide the information, provide data, provide the evidence uh, to the foreign authority, the foreign courts, that that's very difficult to actually to, to, to handle. And we we spend a, a lot of time to communicating with the Chinese uh, government, the Chinese ministries, but it seems uh, kind of. Actually, uh, at least up to now, uh, we we didn't uh, obtain one uh, for, uh, for in those cases. So, uh, and 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 I think this is one challenge uh, the, the Chinese regime and the, the Chinese authority are facing and have to solve in the coming months. Yeah. Uh, so that will be my uh, supplementals. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Next, can we have uh, uh, Ms. Xu? Hi. Hi. Can, can you hear, you hear me? me? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, greetings from Singapore. Thank you very much for having me on this uh, very interesting panel. I'm very um, privileged to share some observations from my part of the world. Um, I'm in Singapore, which is part of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which comprises 10 um, countries in this area. So um, I thought I'd share um, the regional perspective uh, from, from my neck of the woods um, for a change. And uh, my remarks will be in three parts. I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't um, prepare any slides, but I'll try to um, go systematically so that um, it, it will be a little bit clearer for everyone. 
So the first part of my remarks is really to set the scene to explain um, what ASEAN is about. Um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, as I mentioned, comprises 10 countries and um, we've been actively involved in regional um, integration, uh, including economic integration. And with that, of course, there's a lot of attention in the facilitation of trade, movement of goods, services and data to enable businesses to seamlessly um, uh, carry out their operations. So in that context, um, you'll begin to appreciate that ASEAN has to think about how to facilitate business transactions, data flows and so on, uh, while uh, observing, of course, personal data protection um, minimal requirements and I'll speak more about that in a moment. Uh, now, in addition, by way of context, uh, ASEAN um, operates by consensus. The 10 countries normally come to decisions by consensus. All 10 countries would agree. Uh, some people say this is slowing things down, but in a way, this uh, builds the trust, builds the confidence in decisions that are eventually reached because all the countries eventually agree on a, a course of action, Inclu including um, in the area of data management, data governance uh, and principles and so on. Um, also quite uh, common in ASEAN is collaboration. So this will feature a lot in what I'm going to talk about in the next part. Because ASEAN is very diverse, we have different uh, legal systems, civil law and common law, uh, develop, developing less developed countries. So it's a very um, diverse uh, set of countries and um, the laws differ a lot. And in terms of data governance, e-commerce e type laws, electronic signature, um, uh, authentication, uh, legislation and so on, uh, we are also at different levels um, of adoption, of uh, experience and so on. Uh, there's also a need in ASEAN to promote um, uh, or rather to help fill the, the gap in, in digital capabilities because we have a range of um, uh, uh, economic um, capabilities in, in, in the different countries which, which vary a lot. So. Mindful of that background, I will then um, speak therefore in the second part of what I want to mention uh, about the kinds of instruments that are used in ASEAN to, to deal with data management, data governance and so on. Um, as mentioned, because the national laws of the 10 countries are quite diverse, quite different, um, it is not an, an, an objective to make everybody's laws the same. Rather, uh, I think what I observe is through a, a, a number of legal and soft law instruments, ASEAN has been evolving a set of principles, a set of frameworks and a set of uh, very useful tools um, to enable data flows to be smoother, to be uh, trade facilitative. So for example, if we look at um, a document called the ASEAN Data Management Framework, under which there's an ASEAN Cross-Border Flows Mechanism or CBDF, in short, there are two tools which have uh, been developed or are being developed. The first one is the ASEAN cross-border contractual clauses um, for data to be transferred between controllers um, in different countries and another set of model clauses for data which is being transferred between controllers and processes which are in different countries. So you might be wondering why are there model contracts? Clauses. Um, these are really voluntary, is to help entities in the ASEAN region uh, have minimal protective uh, contractual clauses for protection of data when it's transferred intra-ASEAN, cross-border. So it's a voluntary set of uh, template contract clauses. Companies can decide whether they want to adopt them or not. If they do, there's a standard template, it's, it's all set out for them and it covers most of the minimum um, expectations of data protection transfer and so on. So that's one tool. And the second tool that ASEAN is right now developing, I don't have a lot of details because they're still working on it, is called the ASEAN Certification for Cross-Border Flows. Um, I, I, I think that this certification will draw some inspiration from uh, the APEC certification uh, model. Um, for those who are familiar, APEC comprises 21 um, uh, countries uh, or economies and uh, the certification system in APEC, if, if the ASEAN system is modeled on that I'm guessing, uh, will allow um, entities in countries to be certified as being 
uh, adhering to certain um, important data governance principles so that they can transfer data more easily across borders. So the advantage is that if you're a certified enterprise or a certified company, you are uh, basically recognized as having uh, a set of good practices for data protection. Therefore, the transfers are um, uh, recognized. So these are some of the tools that ASEAN as a region has developed. There's a lot more. Um, I just want to touch on one more instrument, which is a legal instrument this time. It's the ASEAN e-commerce agreement, which came into uh, force uh, almost a year ago, about a year ago. And the ASEAN e-commerce agreement um, covers a wide uh, range of digital economy uh, issues, including data, localization, um, transfer of data, and so on. So I, I can speak more about this agreement um, later during the round table. I, I would like to um, just leave it at that and mention that there's this agreement. Um, ASEAN also has free trade agreements with other trade partners. I think in, in um, the previous speaker's presentations, the RCEP was mentioned and ASEAN indeed uh, is part of the RCEP. That also has an e-commerce chapter which contains uh, data transfer, da data flow provisions, which we can talk about um, later as well. The last point that I want to make, or the last part of what I want to mention is that against the backdrop of ASEAN's context and the types of instruments that ASEAN has been developing, um, ASEAN is also very mindful of other related issues such as consumer protection, of which data and personal data privacy protection is a part, obviously. So it's, it's not just a simple data issue, it's data and also um, there's another layer of uh, concerns, consumer protection issues and also cybersecurity issues, of course, which in which data can be stolen, can be hacked and, and can be uh, uh, distributed on, online, etc. So these are all related concerns and um, just to set the seed and to provide the, the broader context. So um, as mentioned, I can speak more later, but I will leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Professor we uh, Weber, we don't have you on screen. Do we have him up? There we go. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I'm supposed uh, to give a perspective uh, of the European uh, countries, perhaps not exclusively European uh, Union, but uh, nevertheless, I would like to start a little bit at a higher level, which we have not yet touched upon. If I say the sentence, uh, cross-border data flow should be uh, legal, free and secure, I would guess that um, everybody would uh, in fact agree to this uh, sentence and from a global perspective uh, we should have more rules uh, on uh, a global level and uh, insofar I just make this as a general remark and possibly we can come back uh, to this uh, remark uh, later during the round <coughs> table. Uh, the WTO uh, has been uh, implemented at a time when uh, digital services were at an infancy stage and so we don't really have uh, good uh, legal uh, rules uh, which would apply in respect of uh, the cross-border data flows on a uh, global uh, level. The classification is completely uh, outdated and I think there is uh, really a uh, need uh, that uh, the efforts which have been initiated uh, some five years ago in Buenos Aires to uh, agree on more adequate rules uh, is imminent. Coming uh, to the um, European uh, perspective, I think I need uh, to distinguish, we do have the European Union and within the 27 member states of the European uh, Union, cross-border data flow is not really restricted or is only restricted uh, to uh, a, a rather uh, minimal uh, extent. Um, since it is the objective of the European uh, Union to have a free and uh, uh, liberal and uh, open uh, space uh, for businesses and for civil uh, society. At least this was the concept some 30, 40 years ago. However, we do uh, have now, if I may say so, a special uh, backlash insofar as uh, the European uh, Union has implemented uh, 
strict rules on data protection and general data protection regulation, which is in force uh, since uh, May 2018. And this uh, leads to an important distinction between personal and non-personal uh, data. I mean, this has already been mentioned in the, uh, uh, interventions uh, before. As uh, far as non-personal data is concerned, it remains uh, with my statement that in principle we do uh, not have many uh, impediments uh, to cross-border data flow as far as personal data are concerned. How, however, obviously, uh, cross-border uh, data flow is subject to compliance with relatively um, strict rules and uh, we have uh, seen in the past that uh, the European Court of Justice is very uh, strict on uh, these uh, compliance uh, issues in uh, particular in two cases relating uh, to uh, cross-border data flow from EU countries to the United States. The European Court of Justice has uh, expressed the opinion that uh, the precautionary measures contained in the legal documents would not be sufficient that, and that in principle cross-border flow of data from EU to um, uh, US would uh, not uh, be legal except under some very uh, specific uh, circumstances. So all of a sudden we uh, do have a new element uh, in the discussions. Of course, we can say that uh, the General Data Protection Regulation has become a little bit a flagship for uh, data uh, protection laws, uh, at least uh, in the uh, Western uh, Hemisphere. Some states in the United States are partly uh, copying uh, the rules uh, of the GD. PR, also some East Asian uh, countries are um, quite uh, close uh, to European uh, uh, rules. For example, uh, the uh, Hong Kong uh, data protection uh, ordinance is relatively uh, close to the European rules with one important uh, exception, of course, the cross-border data rule provision of uh, the EU rules has not been uh, implemented so far in force in um, uh, Hong Kong. As far as uh, cybersecurity uh, is concerned, which is another potential impediment uh, to a free cross-border flow of data, again, we have not been successful in implementing international or global rules. Uh, the UN group of governmental experts has issued five reports, but uh, the results uh, have been minimal. There is a new understanding of the open-ended uh, group of uh, uh, governmental experts, uh, which dates back to uh, spring uh, 2021, but uh, maybe due to the pandemic uh, environment, uh, the uh, efforts have not been really uh, taken up. So we have to um, rely on uh, national uh, rules. And here I would say we see some uh, efforts in the European Union to harmonize um, uh, national rules. Uh, we do have a um, regulation on the security of important network infrastructures. We do have a cyber security um, strategy, but uh, to a very far extent, cyber security um, remains a, a national domain. And uh, all overall, if uh, I try to compare the European uh, approach um, with the uh, Chinese approach, is which has been nicely presented before, I would uh, say that the rules uh, in European Union are less uh, strict, they are more open, notwithstanding some cyber uh, security uh, interests, of course, we have less, for example, data localization rules in Europe than, uh, for example, uh, in uh, China and obviously data and also uh, less rules than for example in Russia uh, and obviously data localization uh, rules hamper uh, the cross-border uh, data uh, flows and this uh, brings me back uh, to a, a final and uh, very general um, remark 
I think we should not only uh, look at uh, legal rules, but more generally also at uh, uh, policies. If I would uh, try to define globalization, I would probably distinguish between three different types of globalization, namely the legal globalization concerns the harmonization of national normative uh, orders or the implementation of cross-border uh, legal rules, as I mentioned in particular now um, the WTO, but also preferential uh, trade agreements, which have gone a little bit further uh, in certain in instances, in particular the free trade agreement between the European Union and Singapore containing digital trade rules. Then the second would be the cultural globalization, which addresses those issues related to manifold social policies and finally the commercial globalization which reflects the existence of increased uh, globalization uh, of businesses and economic activities. I just dropped this uh, into the room but I do think that we should not forget about these general aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much Professor Weber. Um, Ms. Kedia? Uh, thank, thank you so, so much, much for meeting from you, Gary. Um, it's, uh, you, you know, this has been uh, wonderful uh, hearing in a lot of detail about how different countries are approaching uh, data localization and cross-border data flows. Uh, and I feel uh, as I begin that India is perhaps uh, much more conservative than the countries uh, and the groups of countries that we spoke about. Uh, we, um, I mean, there has been a journey. So in the first part of my comments, I uh, focus on where India is and uh, what that journey has been. And in the second part, a little bit on what I think will be the way forward. So uh, India has uh, seen a series of, uh, you know, data localization norms that started very early on with the traditional public sector. But 2013 and 14 onwards, there, there was just like a, a barrage of policies that came out, uh, especially in the financial and banking uh, services sector uh, on localizing uh, data. Uh, which was followed by uh, consultations and deliberations on a privacy bill and the first and the second versions of which had uh, very hard localization uh, policies and mirroring requirements. Uh, something has changed and we do have uh, the recent, uh, not even uh, this last week, uh, India announced it, the latest uh, version of its privacy bill, which was uh, the digital uh, uh, personal data protection bill that seems to have softened its stance on um, data localization, but it doesn't really spell out what is possible and what is not possible, what will be the principles, but at least uh, it has moved away from the need uh, for localization or it, or it seems so. So once we have the details of the policies, we'll know, but a lot of sectoral uh, policies have continued to impose upon the businesses um, the need to localize data. And I, it, this trend or this strong need for uh, sovereign control over data is also reflected in, um, in, in in India's position in several multilateral and bilateral negotiations. Uh, for instance, uh, India opposed uh, the WTO's joint initiative on e-commerce. Uh, we didn't sign uh, the data free flow with trust in 20. Um, 19. Uh, it also did not uh, sign the o the OECD, the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, um, and uh, and all of this uh, just reflects that India is probably not. Uh, we even walked away from the RCEP, those though it said that it was on other conditions, but also a multilateral agreement that had a lot of uh, uh, components of the digital economy. Those were not. Uh, those were not. Uh, uh, those, I mean, because we walked out of the RCEP, those also then reflect that India hasn't made any international commitment through a multilateral arrangement on allowing free flow of um, data. This is um, also reflected in its bilateral uh, agreements that it has with a few uh, countries and some uh, data sort of shows that, uh, you know, of all the 16 recent preferential trade agreements that they have signed, there's only one uh, uh, which talks about data protection and maybe one or two that talks about the free flow of data and those are also uh, just language and not necessarily focusing on uh, focusing on any commitment as it as is in the recent India UAE uh, treaty and in the India Australia agreement that was recently concluded also there isn't any 
commitment on allowing free flow of data. So uh, <clears throat> what we see is definitely a softening of strands and I'll tell you where that is coming or getting reflected. Uh, but it is still much more conservative than what we heard uh, from China or from the ASEAN countries and definitely uh, from the EU and the and the US. So uh, the softening of uh, stance uh, is is reflected uh, in in a in a recognition that cross border data flows uh, have economic costs. And I think um, more than once this has been uh, said to the government that has been there have been more than one report that has provided uh, this sort of evidence to the government that uh, this that uh, you know cross border data flows will help uh, will help trade will help your digital businesses and given the digital ambitions of the country it becomes important for India to allow at least uh, free flow of data with some some safeguards or safeguards so I think that recognition has come. Uh, however, the economic argument that the government uh, has made in favor of data localization is to say that um, you know we are uh, that they're trying to fight what they call digital colonialism because of the domin dominance of big tech companies uh, in India and the sort of data mo monopolization that they fear uh, might take center stage in the year in the days to come. The other uh, economic argument is also that. You know, data localization. If they if they localize data, companies will be forced to set up data centers in India. Uh, there will be more jobs, more infrastructure, more innovation, uh, which could really lead to a, a domestically created uh, digital economy. And we will not be dependent so much on uh, foreign companies for digital services. The second, which is I think runs across the board for all countries, is the national security arguments. We do. Um, have national security concerns uh, even with our neighbors and therefore it it, it becomes important um, that uh, you know there are some localization requirements or at least some understanding of access to data in case of law enforcement incidents given that you know the current uh, the, the current mutual legal assistance treaties does not seem to be working uh, very effectively and the types of cyber crimes have just become uh, much more innovative using cloud-based instruments uh, that are, need not necessarily happen in their own jurisdiction. So both the economic and the security arguments are driving India's position, but um, there seems to be some softening from the absolute hard position to one where they are looking for a middle path. Now to the second part, where that middle path would lie, my suspicion is that it's definitely not going to be uh, the absolute free flow model, uh, which is um, which is uh, which is in the U.S., where uh, the data ownership is with private companies, and uh, there is a sense of uh, uh, there is a sense that privacy is protected, and uh, there is no need for excessive regulation. It uh, probably also will not be the EU model that is. Um, that 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 places privacy uh, at its center. While privacy is extremely important, uh, but one can imagine that in a country with mm -hmm. the sort of uh, digital mm -hmm. coverage that we have, uh, it's surprising that we still don't have a digital. Uh, we don't have a privacy bill. So while privacy is going to be important, the data localization concerns or the data cross border data movements will have elements of privacy, but that will not be the central. Um, the central argument or the ethos of cross-border data flows as it as it is in the EU. So I, I think the the way it, it it's also probably not going to be one like um, Russia or China, but somewhere in the middle. And uh, some reflection of what India is thinking about is a proposal it recently made uh, to the UN ad hoc uh, committee uh, that supports international cyber crime, saying that. They wanted a broader jurisdiction over citizen data. So immaterial of where their citizens were transacting or where the data was stored or processed, India should have um, extraterritorial jurisdiction over uh, that data. And that would therefore uh, curb their concerns or curb their need uh, to localize. So is that a model that they could follow? Uh, they, uh, the, the other uh, thing is also in terms of data sharing frameworks. While Korea and Singapore, uh, you know, they, they're even within their domestic borders, their data sharing models have a lot of involvement of the private sector. But in India's, uh, in India, the, the primary framework, uh, which is the data empowerment and protection architecture is, uh, is very public sector led. Uh, 
so i think uh, where we are going in india is that the government will is not going to give up control but given uh, the economic considerations of costs and the need uh, for digital businesses to allow movement of data there might be a model that is going to be somewhere in the middle uh, where at best uh, we will see uh, bilateral uh, bilateral arrangements working out uh, or uh, bilateral informal arrangements working out or formal arrangements working out or a model uh, that they are going to be able to push uh, at the global level uh, which would uh, which would uh, address their concerns about uh, national security uh, primarily national security and access to uh, data in instances of cyber crime so let me uh, stop here and happy to respond to more questions later i'm very excited i want to see where the middle lies i think that'll be fun to see so uh, linda since i didn't have your bio would you please introduce yourself as my co-moderator Okay, um, my name is Linda Bonio. I am a lawyer uh, based in Kenya. I work at the Lawyers Hub. I founded the Lawyers Hub a few years ago, and we work on digital policy across the African continent. Fabulous, thank you. So Linda and I are gonna co-moderate a round table and then we will open for questions. And I wanna appreciate that we have such a full uh, room today on day, officially day one, actually day two for quite a few of us at this session. So I appreciate the enthusiasm for this very important topic. So our first question to our group is um, talking, we've just heard quite a bit in the table setting exercise of how different uh, uh, parts of the country are looking at the importance of data flow as well as, as data localization and the, the, ch the challenge and opportunities of privacy for citizens as well as you know the interests of government. So can we look at what some of the cross-border uh, challenges are um, in these frameworks? And as um, as Ms. Key has started saying, you know, there's somewhere in the middle for India, but you know we, we do know that EU has a very strong uh, citizen privacy uh, directive, and then we heard quite a bit about what is going on in uh, the Asiana area. So if I will just cue that up to see, I don't know, do you want to start first, kind of the, what you see in between all these different p potentials? Oh, oh yeah, sorry, she was moving, she's like, I was moving, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, <sorry>. um, <laughs> so, um, so we were looking at the multiple models in between the different, uh, you know, continents, so we looked at the, we, we've seen how Asia is looking at this, we see the mm. EU, I'll say, we, 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 we don't have anybody representing the United States because they don't have a privacy law and they just let all that information flow. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> so as the roundtable discussion, we, uh, why don't we start with how you see this uh, possibility of the, the there being cooperation and collaboration and then where do we see the challenges? Yeah, I think uh, from, uh, from uh, my personal uh, uh, point of view, I think, uh, I mean, uh, even, you know, the EU and uh, America has uh, this uh, transatlantic uh, privacy framework. I think uh, uh, in some way, and China and um, EU has to uh, share more commonalities than US, between US and EU. Uh, first of all, why I say that, if, if, if you look at uh, China's personal uh, information protection law, actually it's uh, mirrored, it's mirroring the GDPR, you know, to a large extent. So they take the EU law very seriously. So therefore, you look look at the personal data protection. So even the transborder data uh, uh, assessment framework, you look at uh, those framework I just introduced. We can see, you know, they have a strong protection in terms of data, uh, personal data as well. You know, so if the the data process uh, po uh, operators or processes uh, have process more than one hundred. Uh, uh, hundred thousand, uh, you know, uh, uh, personal data or one million personal data accumulated, and they have to pass the uh, security assessments some, to some extent, and also to meet some uh, requirement for the, the personal data protections. So, so therefore, you know, I think there's a convergence between the EU and the China to some extent. But on the other hand, uh, I think. Uh, America, even uh, towards America's uh, uh, framework, we, we look at the American submission to the WTO, you know, and in that submission, in that submission, actually, they also mention about the privacy protections. Okay, so we will see, you know, in the end, we probably will see uh, uh, even uh, in the Indian and Asian uh, countries, you know, in the end, we see there's a convergence towards like a privacy protection, you know, it's more or less uh, every country will put it, uh, put the privacy protection as one of the criteria. 
issues, you know, uh, for the precondition for data export is the uh, is the, uh, but the whether how strong to protect the privacy that's a very degree between countries. So this is the first uh, conversion. I think uh, that is uh, may uh, may happen. The second thing I think uh, uh, is a uh, uh, in terms of national security. I think many countries have a uh, uh, not 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 on, only China and India. You know, I, I think Asians and also the African countries. You know, African country also put a national security uh, as a one of the preconditions, uh, important exceptions in, in FTA as well. So, uh, uh, but, but, but I think there's an important uh, divergence about uh, how do we uh, define the national security, why, why the EU has a different uh, perception or conceptualization to, uh, with China, you know, and whether the uh, conceptual of the cyber security, or national security in, in, in terms of trade agreements, you know, it's not a, we're talking about cyber security or national security uh, uh, alone, but actually in line of the trade agreements, how do we uh, make a very clear distinguish between what is legitimate uh, national security concern in terms uh, for the trade agreement or digital trade, or what is uh, legitimate, legitimate national security concern. So that, uh, that is a divergence between different countries. Yeah, that, that's my take so far. Thank you. Great. Other panelists? Yes, Dr. Chu. Oh, oh, uh, oh, 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 Share yeah, perspective that's slightly business. different. Um, if we put ourselves in the shoes of businesses, especially small and medium enterprises, which are already struggling to to make ends meet, I think that um, finding the sweet spot in in international rules um, is is important in this exercise to be mindful of businesses' needs in compliance, in understanding what the boundaries are, in understanding how to navigate the rules, and understanding what they can't do, what they can do, and so on. So I think that is an important factor in, in the conversation on finding that sweet spot of what the international or regional or global rules might, might look like. The, the second um, thought I had was um, just listening to, to, to um, uh, other observations was uh, the, the use of the idea of comparability in terms of data protection. Um, in the GDPR, you have the adequacy uh, Agree, agreements or adequacy uh, standard to see whether the other jurisdiction has adequate um, protection uh, offered by the EU's um, as, as equivalent to the EU's GDPR, for example. In Singapore's um, personal data protection legislation, we have a provision, Section 26, which says if you're going to export data out of Singapore, then um, you have to ensure as an enterprise that the protection on the other side is going to be comparable to what is provided for in Singapore. And that need not be by law, it could be by a contractual arrangement. So it gives the businesses that flexibility. So I, I think that that comparability uh, element can help to bridge some of the gaps. Um, the third uh, observation is that right now, I think it's quite fragmented, depending on what issue we're talking about. Um, uh, national laws are fragmented in terms of how they deal with data lo localization. Some countries have those laws, some don't have those requirements. Uh, data transfer rules are different, so there's fragmentation. And I would venture to say even among free trade agreements, there's fragmentation because the provisions differ. Um, and uh, I'll leave it there. I see Mansi nodding, so maybe you can pick up on them, Mansi. Thank you. Thank you, Lakmi. I, I completely sort of agree. I just wanted to add that I think while the principles of national security and privacy are agreed upon, so I don't think there's any debate on why uh, localize or why we need to localize. So I think that's that's one thing that's sorted out that countries are, I mean, the two reasons why uh, they want to localize are probably these, but I think um, uh, protecting the privacy of their individuals, but I think uh, we're, we're not there's the, the technical issues related to uh, in, in terms of the comparability that Lockheed was talking about, the technical capacity, and then there is the politics of all of it. And, um, and, and you know, sometimes when I was comparing India to all of these countries, is to sort of feel bad that, you know, why are we so far behind? What is it that, you know, we are not being able to do? And, and then when I think about it a little bit more, I feel that probably we are not ready, you know, just given the size of our economies and the, the strength of our institutions and uh, we're probably not ready and it's better to jump into these sort of agreements when when we know what to do. Uh, so 
I mean, it, 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 I can quantificate as a researcher, but I'm sure if I was sitting in the government, these decisions would have been much harder to uh, take. But uh, but having having said this, I feel that uh, it's going to be a bit fragmented, and I don't see any harm in it being fragmented uh, for a few years until there is convergence on how every country is more or less looking at. Um, uh, is looking at cross-border data flow. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't worry too much about the fragmentation at this point. I feel every country will work out a way uh, to get to this when they are ready. Any other comments from the other two panelists? Yeah, perhaps if I could make uh, one uh, sentence. I think, uh, again, we should also distinguish between personal data and non-personal data. And if you look at digital trade, a good amount of data is non-personal. So we don't have the restrictions of any uh, privacy uh, laws. And uh, digital trade could substantially be uh, improved uh, uh, if we would not uh, build impediments uh, as far as non-personal data is concerned. And uh, secondly, just uh, following uh, the uh, remark of Professor Lok Shu, we do also have spe special instruments uh, which can be applied if uh, the equal uh, level of protection uh, should be achieved, in particular the so-called uh, privacy harbor uh, agreements. Uh, they have not been successful between US and EU, but nevertheless the instrument exists and could be applied and uh, finally some specific specific rules on uh, data protection privacy are contained in preferential trade agreements or bilateral uh, trade agreements as i mentioned uh, singapore uh, eu and uh, also uh, agreements with korea great yeah, yeah, uh, from, uh, from my angle uh, <coughs> you know overall uh, i'm observing a big gap China's rules and uh, the other major jurisdiction. So, uh, general speaking, China is quite strict in terms of uh, regulating the data cross border transfer, I mean, the uh, outbound uh, data transfer. So, uh, like, you know, if we compare uh, China and the EU, you know, uh, unlike Unlike uh, GDPR, you know, uh, uh, in China uh, there is fewer options for the outbound transfers. Like you know, uh, you know, uh, unlike GDPR, you know, binding corporate rules such as intergroup transfer agreement you know, is not a excellent, excellent, uh, excellent approach uh, here in China. And also, uh, now we don't have the uh, the white list. Countries. And, and also, if, if we compare China's draft standard contracts for the uh, data exports with, uh, the, with the SCC uh, in the EU, uh, the, those provisions uh, in China's draft uh, SCCs uh, are yeah, yeah, much uh, stricter than others. So uh, I'm I I think that uh, uh, you know, China is the second economy in the world, and also uh, every year we export a lot of goods, services, out of the country. And, and I think uh, we, we need more dialogues you know, among those uh, those uh, more institutions and more how to uh, how to promote free uh, trade. Thank you. And Linda, as my co-moderator, do you want to step in with some comments about Africa before we go to the next question? Yes. Um, I think I was going to make a comment on the, you know, what's coming out from the discussion and how I see this as, um, 
you know um, intersect with what's happening across the continent um, so Hila from the African Union I think is online um, and I, I, I even feel like I, I'm not the person to talk about this but I think the African Union has a really great um, interventions that are happening now and um, just to talk about I think the sector specific uh, discussions that have been happening uh, as you talk about trade um, just give me one minute I think as, as oh my god sorry <laughs> um, I think as, as we talk about digital trade, the Africa has a general framework on, um, on, on trade, which is the Africa Free Trade Agreement that came into force in 2021, I believe in January. Um, and from the discussion at the, uh, at the continental level has been that can we have sector specific, you know, data policy, uh, you, you know, framework, especially on, um, on, on, on data flow. Um, and two, uh, I wanted to highlight the discussion that came, I think, from um, India about fragmentation versus harmonization. Um, and if you look at how Africa is structured um, and the process of domestication, which is, um, I think, something that we are um, struggling with within the continent, that how do you domesticate, you know, um, even when you have laws that have been adopted? At the African Union level, we've had the Malabo Convention for the past, you know, since 2014. And we actually haven't got to the 15 states that would ensure that this law is actually um, comes into force in the African continent and yet the same um, countries now are adopting very specific data protection laws internally within uh, within the countries and so I think that there's a mismatch especially around how do you get to agree and this is a difference between GDPR for instance for the 27 states that um, in Europe that enjoy you know um, sort of similar uh, political conditions compared to Africa, we have 55 and the different processes of domestication of um, of, of uh, data privacy rules. I think also the final point that I would like to make would be um, the regional factor where you have um, Southern Africa, East Africa, all having very different, you know, approaches to, um, to data governance. And so you see a lot of model laws coming from uh, the Southern Africa, SADC, um, Southern Africa states really coming up with a lot of digital policy frameworks, the digital economy frameworks that are really important. Um, and then I think the other comment would be on data centers, the requirements to for data localization, when there's actually very little digital infrastructure to support data localization. And so you have a lot of data centers now, countries requiring data centers, um, local uh, data centers for health data and sometimes election data. And yet the data centers are actually run by foreign big tech companies. Um, that, that does not go well. Um, and then I think finally on, um, um, you know, the power of big tech um, com in Africa compared to big tech, you know, elsewhere. Um, Europe has really developed, you know, policies for themselves that are strong because they have come together, you know, and so when, you know, a big tech company is negotiating with Europe, they know that we want the European market and so then we will have, you know, greater, um, you know, uh, you, you know, we, we, we can negotiate with you on data policy issues, but that's not the same for Africa uh, because we don't enjoy the numbers to really come together and say that we are one digital economy and so maybe the discussions that are happening now on the digital single market can get us there in terms of having considering Africa as one data market um, and then you know getting us to negotiate on this um, on this specific front but the Africa digital free trade area um, the discussions happening now on the additional protocol on e-commerce hopefully it will get us to um, to better data flows there's a report that was launched yesterday by the Internet Justice Network on cross-border cross border data policy framework for for Africa. I think it really offers a good overview and it's available on their website if you want to download that. Thanks. Great. All right. Linda, I think I would go to the last question if you want to look at the very bottom and then I'd open it for questions in the group because we're getting a little short on time. I think that's fine. You can go right ahead. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, this is for our roundtable discussion. What are the risks of not developing a common international approach? Uh, will it lead to a digital divide, or will the bilateral or regional trade agreements be adequate for us to continue to use uh, the the current challenges that we have in between uh, tr both trade and uh, digital sovereignty? 
Okay, and <clears throat> so uh, my my remark is that uh, ideally, uh, you know, we, we we wish we hope there's a kind of the minimal, you know, common ground or minimal framework can develop uh, out of the all the, these discussions. So at the moment, uh, WTO is uh, uh, that there's some slow progress uh, in the WTO in terms of e-commerce, you know, negotiation. So uh, whether and uh, how long will this take to um, reach a minimum? agreements so we, we do not know but uh, I think there's a progress and uh, at the same time we as we see you know that's a more and more regional uh, uh, trade uh, free trade agreements and also digital trade agreement uh, the recent uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, uh, they, they have this uh, digital trade agreements so uh, so they, so they will uh, develop it in parallel with the WTO and also other you know uh, trade agreements and and as other speaker just mentioned, you know, there's a also compatibility mechanism, you know, different compatibility mechanism. Also, there's a kind of the mutual recognition agreement. For example, we can mutually recognize each country's uh, uh, legal regulations or, or framework. So there's many also a compatibility mechanism can work to help bring the gaps, you know, bridge the gaps. So uh, and the third one, I just like uh, Professor. Uh, who uh, just mentioned that there's also soft law approach, you know, the soft law or wasn't already uh, the cold approach. So, so we can see, you know, mm, uh, uh, so we, if if there's no uh, global agreement, which is not a uh, ideal situation, but I'm not so pessimistic about uh, uh, the uh, coexistence assistance with different uh, you know regional agreements and the different mechanisms. But in the end, uh, we. We'll, of course, we want to have a minimal agreement at the global level. Thank you. Others on the round table? It's all going to go well, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I, if I could go? Yes, please. Um, so, so, you know, like, like, I, I don't, I don't think, think that uh, anything will happen immediately, just as Yik Chan was saying, it's going to take uh, a while for. Uh, any sort of coordinated um, response to come about, but I think that the broken system will work uh, to 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 help navigate the the global digital economy until then. So it's not as if nothing will move. Uh, there has uh, there has been enough and more uh, trade in the absence of these uh, agreements, uh, and th and there are going to be several other policies that will need to be address to, uh, to to address the problem of the digital divide so while uh, harmonization of cross border data flows is important i don't think that until we reach uh, the point of harmonization uh, it will completely break down uh, economic uh, digital economic engagement across different uh, uh, countries and, uh, and and in order to address the problem of the digital divides which are likely to get magnified given how different countries are moving at different speeds or different aspects of the, dig the digital economy. Cross-border data flows aren't the only uh, thing that uh, can solve that problem. It's, it, in my opinion, it's it's one of the smaller uh, issues to address in the in the divides issue uh, in the divides problem. Um, I, would I would like, like to respectively. Uh, disagree at least to a certain extent. I think if we have a fragmented world, we uh, charge uh, businesses uh, with a heavy administrative load and already now um, if a European com company uh, is active uh, in different uh, countries, some three, four, five people are needed to check out which kind of uh, privacy laws uh, are applicable in these countries. So um, I think uh, minimum uh, harmonization would uh, certainly uh, lower the administrative costs uh, of internationally active entities. Anyone else? Yes, yes, yes. I'm yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. just a quick response. I just wanted to um, agree with what Professor Weber just mentioned. Um, I, I'm not so sanguine as Mancy, Mancy about the fragmentation and that. that that life will go on is it will go on indeed, but I think there's a lot of trade cost and trade friction um, caused by rules that are very disparate, very fragmented, and, and often I think even unclear. 
Um, and just as an example, because even within the trade agreements where you have data localization principles or rules, uh, there are exceptions and the exceptions can be quite broadly worded. And so in that already, there's potential uncertainty as to when a country may pull the pull the ripcord and, and, and say, well, I, I'm going to enact a certain measure under the exception, under the trade agreement. Um, so there's, there's a question mark in terms of what these exceptions uh, scope should be, what how to how to more um, how to clarify what what businesses need to know what they can and cannot do as mentioned before. Um, the other point about the digital divide, I just want to mention an example um, from my region where agreements uh, very often have uh, transition periods for developing countries, where developing countries have a bit more time in which to enact their privacy laws or to fulfill the transfer of. Uh, uh, data flows um, required under such an agreement that they sign. So I think those are little tools within such agreements to help the developing countries in such trade agreements to try to uh, manage and to transition into the, the sort of a new set of principles. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, <clears throat> with, without a, a common international approach, uh, I'm, I'm seeing three risks. Uh, number one, uh, trade barriers. You know, this were abstract commercial communication between countries and regions. Second is the uh, localization and the approval requirements where uh, increase the burden on global uh, on the, on the global uh, enterprises. The third is uh, we lose the opportunity of the digital economy uh, development. So uh, although, although global treaties are more helpful to solve the current dilemma of cross-board data flows, it's difficult to reach such agreement at the present to, up, uh, to be uh, frankly. So that's, uh, I think we can start with reaching more bilateral or regional agreements. So the core issue is that uh, all the countries should respect the national and the security interests of other countries and, and it should not block others uh, from the global data flows. Great, Linda, do we have any questions online? No, not yet, but um, I asked from the chat, I'm going to just maybe comment about an international framework and um, I think that there's been different approaches on um, on how we look at data governance. Um, I think earlier on in the conversation, um, there was the, you know, in Europe, the user is central in, in data protection and we see, um, in my view, America is very company centered um, and so you look at the continent as like Africa where most of our data protection laws now that have been enacted post GDPR really mirror GDPR just like China, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work because of different contexts, different budgets, and also different political structures. And so I think that there is a need to look at this different ways of looking at um, data governance and also to see where does the public interest lie and where does um, also the security, national security lie, because that's also coming out in a lot of um, data, um, data, uh, data from Africa that you know, there's a national security angle and government must still be in control, but how do we achieve uh, data sovereignty uh, without data localization and sort of balance those and agree on that as we proceed to have the global conversations because I think those differing um, points of view really have people in their own corners and deciding on their own data governance approaches. Thank you, that's very helpful. I've got, I, I, yes, I've got a couple people over here. We start here and then you'll be next. Can so you introduce I, I yourself? <coughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, nope, go ahead. So I have a small query, uh, Professor e. Uh, please, I'm uh, Subhash Chakal from uh, Nepal. So I have a small query to Professor Ik uh, has uh, mentioned that the China uh, does the special agreement with the companies for the cross-border uh, data exchanges. So means uh, since I've been looking uh, a couple of uh, years uh, on this issue, so I have a concerns regarding our local context also, how that special agreement will solve a multiple jurisdiction issue of the data protection. 
so means the companies uh, that is getting data belongs to the different jurisdiction and china is a different jurisdiction so how it is working so it would be interesting if uh, we get uh, some more uh, explanation on this thank you you mean the chinese company how to get around of the different jurisdictions is that a, your questions no non chinese company oh, non -Chinese. with the special agreement with the non chinese companies actually okay so exchanges. Okay, you, you, okay, you're not uh, asking me the Chinese already. Okay, I understand your question. So, so I think, yeah, that, that's a big problem, you know, for company which uh, if they multi uh, operate in multiple location and involve different jurisdiction, as I said, you know, uh, if, if your country is not a part of the FTAs, you know, uh, free trade agreement, you do not have these uh, uh, regional agreements, and uh, so your company is not immune from the uh, those uh, uh, local regulations and then you have to of course compile to each jurisdiction individually you know it is very costly that's why well, just all the other speakers say you know it's ideally we can have the regional or, or ideally international agreement to reduce the burden of the companies so uh, otherwise uh, you have to sign up this uh, like a Chinese China and also European you know they have this contract standard contract and sign up between the individual company to deal with these issues according to different jurisdictions yeah okay thank you next over here can you introduce yourself oh yes. thank you uh, my name is in chen and i'm a phd candidate uh, at Tsinghua university from china and i'm doing research on the data governance so i really appreciate the insights from the speakers and it, uh, from the perspective of the government it's showing a divergence and policy fragmentation on the data governance and i have a question regarding the perspective from the business sector so i i wonder what's the role of the business sector for instance the digital the digital uh, companies their role in in the national regulation making and also what's their role in the international data governance and cooperation since like in the digital economy uh, the the big digital uh, company they can they are gathering the data and they use the data and uh, and I guess they are and they are a significant actor in the data governance and cooperation thank you does anybody want to have comment on that comment <laughs> Yes. May I try? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think uh, at least in the Western uh, Hemisphere, the um, uh, business sector is usually involved uh, in the preparation uh, of the laws and has some uh, impact uh, on uh, the exact uh, uh, formulation of legal provisions. And uh, apart from uh, that, we do see uh, many uh, soft law standardizations uh, in the Western uh, Hemisphere. I can really not speak in detail about um, East uh, Asia. And we have, for example, seen already four years ago that uh, Microsoft has developed a cyber crime convention proposal, something like that, uh, since Microsoft has expressed the opinion that it would be important to have global uh, rules on uh, combating uh, cyber uh, crime. Uh, finally, uh, the uh, whole efforts have come to almost a, a still stand because many governments were relatively hesitant to follow uh, a business uh, um, oriented uh, approach and maybe there were also good reasons to have uh, some hesitations to uh, accept the Microsoft proposal. But I just wanted to say uh, it is the case that uh, businesses are actively uh, involved in the rule uh, setting. Great. Ms. Kedia, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to refer to a study that we did in India. Uh, uh, we ran a survey across uh, companies, both uh, multinational big companies, medium-sized companies and small companies to get their reactions on uh, India's current policies on cross-border data flows. Uh, and this was mostly an exercise to uh, look at the economic uh, costs or the opportunity costs of uh, not having uh, the uniform law which have uh, uh, which, which have been told, uh, or, or at least the opinion is that uh, is necessary. So what we found uh, 
in uh, from the survey is that um, uh, this is a very s the the requirement for cross border data flows at least in india seem to be a very spe sector specific issue so this came uh, for sectors uh, so sector companies that belonged to the communication services sector or the financial services sector seemed much more affected by uh, the lack of harmonized laws uh, or uh, the restrictions on cross border data flows um, and these were also companies that were uh, were mostly large sized multinational corporations and not necessarily small or medium sized businesses in the uh, country several other countries that also had digital models did not necessarily seem to worry too much about the data localization also there was a balance i'd say in terms of uh, how companies were feeling this is just evidence from uh, one survey but i thought i'll put it out in terms of um, understanding what businesses how at least businesses uh, in india enterprises across the board are uh, are reacting to the government's position on cross-border data flows. Thank you. Dr. Shu, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, yes, just a small one. one. Um, in relation to the role of um, the private sector, I think if we look at some of the recent agreements, um, the private sector is looped in uh, specifically. So, for example, the um, ASEAN agreement on e-commerce, uh, there is a provision on stakeholder engagement which um, specifically mentions that the ASEAN member states should regularly uh, speak to stakeholders, engage them, including private sector members and even academia. So um, I think we're beginning to see that it is a, a, a recognition even within a formal treaty that this sort of engagement with the private sector is, is, is very important. Thank you. Great. We had a question over here. Okay. Thank you. I'm Mohammed Yassin from University of Lille. France. Um, I would like uh, just to touch on the issue of the African continental free trade area. It is totally uh, marginalized in this panel, uh, even in terms of uh, comment and participation, because uh, as uh, our sister mentioned that if we go and negotiate as local, uh, local dimensions, we are not going to gain anything. We have to have a continental dimension to to have our proper position and maybe not to stick the, to these uh, borders of uh, imposed by the colonial uh, system still on the continent uh, and surprisingly uh, uh, we we are not uh, learning from the the experiences of the United States or European Union or or the other continental dimension like uh, China or or India when they was when they go in terms of when they go for trade issues uh, and uh, secondly on the issue of the data the African continent itself as long as it is fragmented also it is poor in terms of data so there is nothing to protect as such they need to uh, post the cross-border uh, cooperation in order to build reliable data which will enable them to uh, at least boost their their development and integration in the global economy a lot of need to be done on that and i think uh, it is uh, just a comment the uh, the uh, african continental free trade area uh, uh, it is young now uh, eight countries started as guiding as a guiding um, countries uh, but needs, this need to be scaled up as as much as possible, and also we need accelerators for that, because if we follow the same pace, we are not going to reach anywhere. Uh, this uh, is, is crucial, and now the digitalization of this transformation is in itself it is an accelerator. We have to uh, take stock of that and work uh, seriously on that, and maybe uh, uh, enable this. Uh, these countries not to uh, just be a receiver of uh, of uh, of uh, inflow of uh, of goods and services, but to to uh, to at least add value to what they are exporting to the to the rest of the world, and uh, at least uh, promote the free uh, flow of goods and services and persons, and maybe work more seriously on that. This is just a comment. Thank you. No, thank you for your comment. Actually, I was talking to Linda about this earlier, and I don't know if you have an addition, but I also was wondering, are there bilaterals while you're waiting for the African Union to, to ratify? Um, so I would say this. Um, 
we have the Africa Data Policy Framework that was endorsed by heads of states this year um, in February 2022 that offers an additional sort of mechanism um, for that. But also we do have different African countries that have done trade agreements like the Morocco, um, I think USFTA that has provisions on, on, on digital trade and data flows. Um, and then two, um, I wanted to just mention that already about 33 African countries have passed data privacy laws and um, GSMA released their data and mentioned that about 21 of them already have provisions on cross-border data flows um, and most of them are looking for one safeguard and most of the transfers are actually conditional. Um, yeah, so meanwhile, I do not see a continental framework that would uh, um, provide this yet. And so calls now, even at this IGF, by the um, network of parliamentarians on IGF within Africa are calling for ratification of the Malabo Convention um, as a sure step to getting us there. Uh, but then also there's a movement towards ratifying, having, you know, calling on the African Union to ratify the Malabo Convention. Um, but it's been too long since 2014 and a lot has changed and so ratifying it will not really make a difference uh, because a lot has changed COVID and then technology as well um, yeah great any any thoughts from our roundtable before we on the comments okay we're gonna let Linda have the comments on that any other cut in the back of the room yeah. A very, very short uh, comment. Uh, Africa has uh, been really front runner in uh, mobile payment, uh, and PESA and uh, Safari. So, uh, I mean, there are good merits uh, in uh, African uh, inventions. Yeah, he says it's Vodafone. <laughs> okay, in the back of the room, we have a it's question. A fire uh, please the, identify yourself. The, uh, Colin Weapon. I'm from the Information Regulator in South Africa. I'm a commissioner. I serve together with uh, Advocate Pensi Tlakula, who's the chair. Um, we've done some interesting um, work um, um, on our benchmarking, rather, with uh, some countries with regards to the approach to achieve and to understand how adequacy of uh, cross-border data flows will work. In Canada, it is up to the company or the controller to assess adequacy. In South Africa, it is up to the company or the data controller to assess adequacy by taking the South African law and see if the country that you are going to transfer data to is adequate in terms of our law. In the UK, they have developed tools, but not the regulator, not the ICO, the Department of Sports and Digital digital something has developed those tools. The question that I asked was that, um, so is the approach now that you are going to assess adequacy in terms of your law, the, the country that you're transferring to? They said yes, but in our situation, we are going to grant the uh, EU automatic uh, adequacy and then the question then becomes in this fragmented approach <laughs> who's going to do what so uh, uh, the difficulty uh, the Irish because they then because we've done some work and just asked and, and engaged and it's a fragmented approach across the whole world so uh, we shouldn't even bother just looking at South Africa because the whole world has uh, this problem and we should design tools that will become the standard uh, because um, although Africa is trading to a certain extent amongst the different African countries um, the volumes and the margin is not as big as high as opposed to Europe and then when you look at the approach 
you will then have to look at uh, fulfilling the adequacy requirements in terms of the ICO, the UK, fulfilling the adequacy requirements in terms of the Canadian law, fulfilling, and it just becomes a mess. Yeah, I'll stop there. Any comments on it's a mess and we need to figure this out? <laughs> I, I think I, I think uh, in response to that, uh, I think if you look at the recent uh, WTO uh, negotiation, you know, African uh, uh, groups actually submit a position uh, to the WTO, which uh, so I was surprised to to, to know that uh, uh, the, the, the 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 African continent has a, is is forming the free trade agreement, but in the in the submission to the WTO, they explicitly say that uh, you know they do not uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, Welcome this free trade agreement in terms of transborder uh, trans transborder data flows. So they want to have a more self uh, protective industry policy. So I think the, the, the so I think that the the, the the African country already realize that you know. Uh, so they already state their position quite clearly in the WTO agreements. So I think that that's my response, and it's up to the country, uh, continent, country, different countries, or even the African Union, you know, to decide it, uh, uh, which way they will go forward. Will, will they want to uh, join the uh, international trade uh, uh, flows, or they want to have a more, you know, self-protective uh, in industry policy uh, for their own continent or different countries in, the, in Africa? I think, yeah. Thank you. Great. Any last comments from our panelists as, before we close out? If we've done it, okay. I'm I'm thinking. I'm feeling. Oh wait, we have one more comment over here in the over here on the side of the room. Okay. Our Thank you. Uh, my name is Vincent Museminari. I'm from Rwanda. Just want to ask some clarification from the presenters. Uh, like uh, Singapore, I know there there have been dealing with data protection for a long time. They want to know how they deal with data controller and data processors. If they give them the license or if they pay the money for operating. And uh, also, uh, I, I have another issue that I, I have some clarification. It, it's just the issue related to Africa, African Union, uh, Data pressure in the, the Cybersecurity Convention, as uh, you, as you said, it has been uh, I think approved in 2014, and uh, four, uh, 14 countries or 13 have now ratified the convention, and uh, we need only one or two countries to be able to go in force. I'm asking the African Union if they have the this advocacy to bring more member state to ratify the convention at least so that you can start to use that the tool and maybe with FCFTA in the future uh, we'll be able to sort out the issue of cross border because I think it's an issue now and uh, uh, together we can sort out that issue uh, in the future. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think we are out of time. I want to thank everybody for being a wonderful, patient uh, discussant and audience on this very, very important topic. I think India might be right. We might end up somewhere in the middle. So we will continue to have this discussion. And um, I, I want to uh, uh, applause for everybody who's still in the room to thank everybody who spent the time today to discuss this. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And everyone Bye. online, thank you. Bye. Thank you.